George Mikan is the reason for Shaquille O'Neal, Dirk Nowitzki, and Nikola Jokic. Two Hall of Famers and a future Hall of Famer for those who don't know. Big men weren't always a thing in basketball, and by weren't always a thing, I mean didn't have a lot of representation before 1947. George Mikan's nickname was Mr. Basketball, and also Marty's dad from Back to the Future. And he redefined the way professional basketball was played, because people didn't think that large, lumbering players had the agility needed for a sport that required so much finesse. His rebounding and blocking were unparalleled, not to mention he had an ambidextrous hook shot. He played in the NBL, which was the basketball association that eventually merged with the BAA to become the NBA. He also played with the Chicago Gears, which have nothing to do with today's Chicago Bulls, as well as the Minneapolis Lakers, which have everything to do with the Los Angeles Lakers because they're literally the exact same franchise. And you can see that he was not only a well-decorated and respected player, but that even great prestige, recognition, and accomplishment leave us all after death. Actually, he was named on the NBA 75th anniversary team in 2021, so he's lasted longer than most. But seriously, even one day the NBA won't exist. George was born to a Croatian father and a Lithuanian mother. And as a boy, he shattered one of his knees so badly that he had to stay in bed for nearly a year and a half. So if a shattered knee can recover to support a 6'10 man in basketball, then your shattered dreams can recover to support your own life. Mikan was found by a basketball coach in high school and was initially reported to have been clumsy and shy. He took George and they worked out intensely, transforming him into a confident, aggressive player. It was during this time that he developed that ambidextrous hook shot that I mentioned before. One mark of George's influence on the game of basketball is that he is the exact reason that goaltending became illegal. If anyone ever shot the ball, he would just snatch it right out of the air like Cusco does to Pacha in the Emperor's New Groove. Prior to Mikan's dominance as a center, it was much more common for shorter people to be in the league. I mean, just look at these guys. They're like my height. Mikan said, when other guys went to take a shot, I'd just go up and tap it out. So it was basically just a game of NBA Street Volume 2 before he came along. He was the NCAA College Player of the Year two years in a row and an All-American player three times. He once had a game where he scored 53 points by himself, which was the same as the team they were playing against. You can see that when he started playing for the Chicago Gears, he looked like the aforementioned Marty's dad. But by the time he was playing for the championship Lakers team, he was less dad, more Chad. The Gears period lasted only about a year and essentially fell apart due to poor management. After that, Mike and played for the Lakers for 11 years, which is where this list of championships comes from. They won five championships in the 11 years that he played, pretty much making them the first ever dynasty in basketball. He's a big part of the reason, in addition to Magic, Shaq, Kobe, and LeBron, that the Lakers now stand at the top of NBA Finals appearances. In his first season with the Lakers, Mikan made himself the first player ever in the NBL to score over 1,000 points. Keep in mind, this was before the three-point shot was introduced. After the NBL and the BAA combined, the Lakers won the first ever NBA championship. After a six-game series in which Mikan averaged 31.3 points per game. Now, if you're someone who doesn't follow basketball, let me offer some perspective. Professional players today are hoisted up on pedestals for scoring more than 30 points in a game. George Mikan averaged that during a championship series without a three-point shot. The next year was no less impressive with Mikan averaging 28 points per game during the regular season. And guess what incredibly important statistic they began recording that year? Gosh dang rebounds! Somewhere in the 1950s, someone was like, hey, it seems to have an impact on the game when someone grabs the ball after it's shot. So I guess they started writing it down. And what's absolutely crazy is that this took place in the same year as the lowest scoring NBA game in history, in which the Pistons took a 1918 lead over the Lakers because they just passed the ball back and forth the entire game. Because the shot clock hadn't been invented yet. George Mikan's entire career was before rebounds, the three-point shot, and the shot clock. And if you don't find that interesting, then how did you find this channel? Because the algorithm is clearly pushing content that supersedes my intentions. Now, if you think videos naturally taper off in quality towards the end, you're wrong. Because the next year, in the 1952 championships, Mikan's Lakers faced off against the New York Knicks. There we go, now we're starting to see some familiar teams. Neither team was able to play on their home courts in the first six out of seven games in the series. 
Why, do you ask? The article doesn't say for the Lakers, but for the New York Knicks, Madison Square Garden was booked out by none other than the Barnum & Bailey Circus for the greatest show on earth. Yeah, that greatest show on earth. I thought P.T. Barnum lived in the 1800s. He did, but his company was bought and merged with the Ringling Bros which would go on to create a traveling circus which would occupy the Knicks' home stadium during the 1952 NBA Finals. Which, quick side note and shouldn't be a hot take, P.T. Barnum was an awful person and The Greatest Showman never should have been made. Make whatever musicals you want. Load them up with messages about acceptance. But don't base them on the person who's the literal opposite of the messages you're trying to convey. It's like if a hundred years from now we made a musical about Joe Exotic, but we portrayed him to be a great person instead of a man who abused both animals and humans. Which is exactly what P.T. Barnum did. But let's not forget the actual video we're making here. After winning the 1952 NBA Finals, the Lakers won $7,500, which was split amongst the team. And don't worry, I already threw that into an inflation calculator. It's $82,000 in today's money, which just happens to be half of the 2011 Boston Bruins Stanley Cup bar tab. George Mikan played out the rest of the champion streak that I mentioned earlier and ended his career right before the age of 30. He said, I had a family growing and I decided to be with them. He sustained 10 broken bones and 18 stitches throughout his career, most of which he played through. He was the first player to ever score 10,000 points in a single career. In 1959, he was the first player ever to be inducted into the NBA Hall of Fame, and the Associated Press declared him the greatest basketball player in the first half of the 20th century. Since back in those days, a sports career wasn't enough to retire on, Mikan did everything from run for Congress in Minnesota, to briefly coaching the Lakers himself, to renovating buildings around Minneapolis. Most notably, however, he became the commissioner of the American Basketball Association, or ABA. You might recognize these basketballs as having the red, white, and blue colors instead of the traditional brown in the NBA. The ABA was short-lived at nine years as a competitor to the NBA. But to further solidify George Mikan's influence on the game, it introduced the three-point line and eventually merged with the NBA, adding several of the teams that we know today. Mikan was married to his wife for 58 years before his death in 2005 and left behind six children. He is widely recognized in the world of basketball for his accomplishments and was able to see the team he played for go through the historic runs we know of today. Shaquille O'Neal himself paid for Mikan's funeral, saying, without number 99, there is no me. The statue of his signature hookshot sits in front of the Timberwolves arena and his 1948 trading card is one of the most expensive trading cards ever sold, having recently gone for $800,000 on eBay in March of 2022. So the next time you hear about one of these guys, just remember who paved the way. See you guys for the next one.